1915, the world was in the grips of a global conflict. World War I had been raging for less than a year and was quickly developing into the first modern war. In 1915, war was considered to be a male affair. Women were not expected to fight nor to be at the front lines, but there are a few accounts of several women actually getting to the trenches alongside the men. One such woman to reach the trenches was 19-year-old Dorothy Lawrence. Born in Britain, Lawrence was an ambitious journalist who, when war broke out in 1914, desired to be a war correspondent on the conflict. Her dream of reaching the trenches would prove difficult and challenging. This is the incredible story of how Dorothy Lawrence managed to sneak into the trenches of World War I. In the summer of 1915, the German army was in occupation of most of Belgium and large parts of northern France. The Allies had suffered their first gas attacks at the Second Battle of Ypres. All armies at the Western Front were looking for a way to break through the deadlock. Armies on either side invested in chemical weapons. Trench warfare was in its infancy, but it would become infamous with the Great War. 500 miles of trenches and fortifications stretched from Switzerland to the Channel. The stalemate at the Western Front caused both sides to get inventive. Any technological advance would be beneficial for any side that was looking to penetrate the enemy's lines. New technologies such as tanks were developed. German Zeppelins carried out the first aerial bombing campaigns on Britain and by the end of the year British Home Front saw the mass mobilisation of women into industries previously closed to them. In August that year, after several weeks of trying to get to the front lines by herself in civilian attire, Dorothy was now situated in Paris. She was determined to get a big story and pleaded with the London newspapers to let her go report on their behalf. Dorothy's request, however, was rejected by the papers. They themselves stated that their own reporters couldn't get close enough to the action what made her think a woman could possibly do it. Undeterred by the newspaper's refusal, Dorothy decided to formulate a plan to get to the trenches herself. At the time, Dorothy recalled thinking, I'll see what an ordinary English girl without credentials or money can accomplish. If war correspondents cannot get out there, I'll see whether I cannot go one better than these big men with their cars, credentials and money. I'll see what I can manage as a war correspondent. In Paris, Dorothy befriended two British soldiers. She told them her plan to get into the trenches disguised as a man, and they quickly agreed to help. The soldiers arranged to meet her under a tree on a famous boulevard. There they would pass her uniform wrapped in newspaper and would pretend she was doing their washing. The soldiers met Dorothy many times, each time depositing her several items of uniform. Privately, in her own accommodation, she would try this uniform on and figure out how to make it fit. Dorothy wrote about her experience. Have you ever attempted to incline trousers in the way that they should go on a female figure? I was left alone to struggle with unknown buttons, braces, and the division sum of how to make my body fit into these trousers. Roughly about 200 miles in that direction. It would be 
across about two miles from the line. But all cost. With the two British soldiers, Dorothy Lawrence forged her own papers and created the identity of Private Dennis Smith of the 1st Leicestershire Regiment. Privately, Dorothy tried on the uniform and began to make adjustments to better pass herself off as a man. Along with the physical transformation, Dorothy was well aware that she would need to act like a soldier and have the correct documentation. Her two accomplices aided her with these details by teaching her how to march and get her official papers to forge. At the time, the fastest way to travel was by train, and it was at St. Lazare Station that Dorothy Lawrence was to start her adventure. She won the confidence of two military policemen who worked at the station. Using all her charm and persuasion, she managed to convince one of them to cut her hair and another to smuggle her onto a train headed for Anya. From Amya, Dorothy Lawrence was going to head to Berthune, as advised by her accomplices. Still in civilian attire, she took with her her soldier uniform, documents and bicycle. From Amya, Dorothy Lawrence got off the train and decided to cycle her way to Bethune. Dorothy followed a stretch of road, thinking she was heading to Bethune. She encountered few peasants on the way, and occasionally a soldier. The sound of nearby bombardments grew ever closer. Unbeknown to Dorothy, she had in fact been on the wrong road. It was by accident that she ended up at the front lines at Albert. There she encountered the Third Army, consisting mainly of Scottish regiments. It is also at Albert that she first saw the Royal Engineers. But her presence was a surprise and caused quite a stir amongst the men. Upon arrival, she was escorted to meet the officers. The officers told Dorothy of her mistake and allowed her to stay overnight at Albert in a room above a tavern. The next morning, an officer directed her onto the correct road to Bethune. Along the road, she passed many stunned soldiers. Rethinking her plan, Dorothy decided that she should try to attempt to get into the trenches at Albert as she was already there. Upon the road, she met a Lancastria miner who was in the Royal Engineers Regiment, Sapper Tom Dunn. Becoming quick friends, Sapper Dunn agreed to help her. Sapper Dunn advised Dorothy to lose the bicycle and to keep out of sight. Together, they went in search of a place where she could hide until the time was right for her to join him in the trenches. It was in a derelict cottage at the front lines of Albert that Dorothy was to wait for Sapper Dunn. With no roof, Dorothy slept under the night sky at the mercy of the weather and nearby bombardments which shook the ground most evenings. She even recalled hearing bullets whistle past her head in the night time. This was a taste of what was to come. Dorothy had to rely on Sapper Dunn for food, which he delivered whenever he could. After several days of waiting, Sapper Dunn finally came to collect Dorothy to sneak her into the trenches. He talked her through how to act and what to say Sapper Dunn walked with Dorothy Lawrence towards the barracks, 
There, they would line up with the rest of the soldiers and would be put on duty in the trenches. With the aid of Sapper Dunn, Dorothy Lawrence disguised herself as Private Dennis Smith and snuck into the trenches with the Royal Engineers 51st Division, 79th Tunneling Company. For 10 days and nights, she experienced the realities of war. She came under fire of shells, rifles, and shrapnel. She spent time in no man's land, the dangerous piece of ground between the opposing trenches. Dorothy learnt to lay mines. It was a two-man job, with one man to prepare the fuse, while the other had the responsibility of laying the mine. In Dorothy's own words, she herself admitted that she did not like doing the job of lighting the fuse and decided not to actually strike the light. She feared this act would officially change her into a murderer, as she was not officially a member of the British Army. Near the end of her 10 days and nights, Dorothy began to think earnestly about her adventure. After witnessing the harsh truths of war, she realised that if anything were to happen to her, her sex would be revealed, her accomplices would be discovered, and the British Army's reputation would be severely damaged. With these concerns in mind, Dorothy began to take steps to counter them. First, she burnt all documents that implicated her accomplices. Whilst in no man's land, she wrote her will in case anything should happen at the front lines. And finally, she arranged with Sapper Dunn to tell their sergeant who she really was. She met the sergeant by a cottage in town and told him her story and her true identity. She made it clear she wanted to stay in the trenches to report on the action, but that she needed somebody else higher up to realise who she was in case anything should happen to her persons. The sergeant she spoke with agreed to keep her identity a secret. However, later on that night, he came back with two officers. They had come to arrest her. The soldiers came across the cottage, but couldn't find Dorothy, and were about to raise the alarm. Seeing it as the best option, Dorothy decided to come clean and stepped out before them. Okay, I am here. In the name of the King, I place you under arrest. First of all, I'd like to say that I'm an Englishman. That night, Dorothy Lawrence was taken to the headquarters and brought before the colonel. All witnesses were stunned by her presence and apparel. Completely perplexed, the colonel had no idea what to do with her and stated as much. Dorothy was questioned by the colonel and his officers, during which she firmly stated that she was not a spy and did not give away any of her collaborators. That night, the colonel arranged for her to sleep in a living room space on a couch, as there was nowhere to place a lady at the barracks. The next morning, an officer from the Secret Intelligence Department arrived to question Dorothy and to take any evidence she had in her possession. Later, two officers arrived to take her away, back to St. Nilius. There, she was interrogated again. She was to be imprisoned for several days, and questioned further. In total, Dorothy believes she was cross-examined ten times. Finally, when the officers realised she was not a spy, she was sent to the convent de Bon Pasteur in Angers, France. There she was to remain until the end of the war, with strict instructions not to divulge her tale 
until after the war was over. Dorothy's story happened in a time when women were starting to challenge the norm. Before the war, women in Britain had been protesting for the chance to have equal rights. The war gave women opportunities to go into jobs and positions they'd never had before. For the first time, women were allowed to be in specialised jobs, not just in ammunition factories, but also in shipyards and engineering. They also proved themselves as doctors and policewomen, to name a few other roles. With the vast population of men away at the front fighting, women took these jobs on and proved that they could do them just as well as the men. In 1918, the women's contribution to the war effort was recognised. The Representation of the People Act was passed by Parliament. This gave women over the age of 30 the ability to vote. This was a small step towards equality. What makes Dorothy Lawrence's story all the more impressive is that her tale takes place at a time where most of these changes for women haven't occurred yet. The mobilisation against the war effort hasn't happened and the 1918 vote is still years away. Sadly, Dorothy didn't get the chance to tell her story until her book was published in 1919. By that time, her chance of getting a big break with her tale was long since diminished. Unfortunately, her book was not the popular hit she desired. Still, Dorothy Lawrence's story deserves to be known. For a young woman of the time to go into the front lines, disguised as a man, putting herself at risk and her reputation on the line was a most daring endeavour.